Joining me now is Jim Rickards, the author of firstly The Currency Wars and now the new book called The Death of Money. Here it is. Now, uh, Jim, thanks for joining us. Thank you, Alan. Um, I read your first book, mm -hmm. uh, Currency Wars. Uh, it was very interesting and in fact defined really a lot of the discussion about global financial um, relations for the following three years since mm -hmm. 2011 when it came out. And now you have a new book, Death of Money. Now, what do you mean by the death of money? Money can't die. Well, it can, it can go away, so it's uh, the equivalent of dying. It really focuses on the potential collapse of confidence in the U.S. dollar. However, the dollar comprises 60% of global reserves. It's obviously the centerpiece or the keystone of the international monetary system. So if the dollar dies or confidence collapses in the dollar, it'll collapse in all paper currencies at the same time. When I talk about the collapse of the international monetary system, uh, the, the system actually has collapsed three times in the past 100 years. It collapsed in 1914, again in 1939, again in 1971. So these things are not that unusual, and I expect another collapse will come sooner than later because of bad policy. Well, what right? happened in 1971 was simply the end of the Bretton Woods system and the, the, going, the US dollar going off gold. Right. So you're saying that was a collapse? Well, yeah. It didn't feel like it at the time. Well, I lived through it. It, 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 it did uh, from the point of view of the United States. I mean, I would go out at lunch. I, I never went out uh, barely a day when you didn't see a chain snatching in New York. I haven't read the book yet, but the, I noticed that the last chapter is called Maelstrom. Mm -hmm. That's a pretty um, scary title. Is that your, uh, are you saying that that kind of maelstrom or general social collapse is the most likely outcome? Um, yes, because uh, if, uh, if policymakers had the right models, they would see what I'm seeing, what I'm describing in the book, and what others see, which is that the system is dynamically unstable. It's increasing in scale. Scale can be measured by the gross notional value of derivatives and banking transactions. There are the metrics for scale. But if you understand complex systems, you know that the worst thing that can happen is not a linear function of scale, it's an exponential function. So what that means is that if you triple the size of the system, you know, Wall Street would say, well, you haven't increased the risk at all because it's all long, short, long, short, long, short. That's wrong. Uh, common sense or intuition might say if you triple the system, you've tripled the risk. That's also wrong. With an exponential function, if you've tripled the system, you've increased the risk by a factor of 10 or 100 or some very large amount. So the risk built into the system is unprecedented. When the collapse comes, it will also be unprecedented. It'll be bigger than the Fed. Uh, the IMF is going to have to ride to the rescue of the world. Yeah, but social unrest, uh, social collapse, riots, look at income inequality. These are all serious problems that are going on side by side with this monetary collapse. So what are you doing with your wealth to prepare for this? Are you buying gold? Yeah, I buy gold. I, uh, I, I'm a portfolio manager, so I have gold in my portfolio that I manage for other investors. I have gold personally. I recommend it to clients. Now, I don't recommend too much. I recommend 10 to 20 percent of investable assets. So 10 percent for the conservative investor, 20 percent for the more aggressive investor. You don't in need gold. In gold, right. physical gold. Not gold mining shares, by the way. I mean, there may be a place for gold mining shares, but I don't own any gold mining shares, and I, I don't. I'm not expert in that. I'm talking about physical gold bullion in safe non-bank storage, which you know can easily be arranged with a number of secure logistics providers. Non-bank storage. Non-bank storage, right? Because there's a high correlation between when you're going to want your gold the most and when the banks will be closed. In other words, in a real financial panic, you're really going to want your gold, and that may be exactly when the banks are closed, and you can't get to your gold, even if it's in safe deposits. So with non-bank storage, by the way, I recently uh, returned from Switzerland. I met with vault operators, secure logistics providers, refiners, people on the physical side of the gold business. And what they told me was that they're seeing flows coming out of the banks, so UBS, Credit Suisse, and Deutsche Bank, going into private storage at places like Viamat, G4S, Brinks, and others. So, so it doesn't change the supply of gold, but it's moving from bank hands to private hands. The last time it was on the gold standard, uh, it was $35, as you said before, $35 right. an ounce. So if we were, to, we were to go back to the gold standard in some way, why would that necessarily mean an increase in the price? Why wouldn't it go back to being $35? Well, one of the most common objections to a gold standard, and it's, it's, it's a meaningless objection, but you hear it all the time, is we can't have a gold standard because there's not enough gold. Uh, you look at the volume of world trade, world finance, bank balance sheets, you look at the physical amount of gold, even at today's price, which is you know around $1,300 an ounce, give or take, but they say there's not enough gold to support all, the, all those transactions. Well, that's nonsense. There's always enough gold. It's a question of price. In other words, at $1,300 an ounce, there's not enough gold. But at $10,000 an ounce or $20,000 an ounce, there is enough gold. The same amount of gold 
can support a larger volume of transactions at a higher dollar price per ounce. So you can go back to gold, you can go back to a gold standard at any price you like, but you better get it right. It better be a non-deflationary price. And aren't you just being a, uh, an old-fashioned kind of guy talking about gold? Isn't the new standard going to be Bitcoin? Uh, I, I doubt it. Uh, Bitcoin has a, a lot of problems, in, you know, including a lot of fraud and a lot of failures. Look, um, the thing about Bitcoin is that the thing that, that a lot of people don't understand, although it's becoming more apparent, if I buy a Bitcoin for $100, let's say, and then I cash in my Bitcoin for $200 of goods and services, I have a $100 gain. I have to put that on my tax return. It's no different than buying and selling a share of stock. And so I dare say that a lot of people transacting in Bitcoins are not bothering to put that on the tax return. So they're all tax evaders, at least in the US. We know the tax system has been used for political enforcement. It's been aimed at the Tea Party. So I wouldn't want to be on the wrong side of uh, the IRS coming after political enemies based on their transactions in Bitcoin that they failed to report. So that's one problem right there. Also, Bitcoin's never been through a business cycle. It was invented in 2009. Well, we've been in an expansionary phase since then, not a very strong one, but the economy has been growing. We don't know how Bitcoin will perform in a downturn or a bear market. We've seen stocks and bonds and gold and other things go through those cycles, but not Bitcoin. There are, there are a lot of problems. Here's, here's what I think about Bitcoin. Bitcoin is a, a currency. Uh, although not one recognized by any government. It's also a technology. I think the technology may have a future because it's, a, it's an open source, widely distributed, inexpensive, secure way to transfer title to anything. It doesn't have to be currency. It can be stocks, bonds, land. So I think Bitcoin may have a future. I think it'll die out as a currency, but has a future as a technology. I suppose what I'm talking about is that. I mean, in the sense that, um, you know, you're talking about as an alternative to money, death of money, gold right. is the alternative, right. which is just a mineable metal that happened to be used a long time ago. We're actually we're in the digital revolution now. They've created this new um, transaction. How does your Bitcoin work without electricity? Well, it, you need electricity. Well, well, you're Since, you're well in fact, it's mined using it. It's, it's based on electricity. Right. How does it work without the internet? How does it work without computers? Now, you're presupposing that we have a future of electricity and internet and computers that all works fine. What I'm suggesting is that... Oh, we're going back to caves. Well, no, we're not going back to caves. It could be a more agrarian type of lifestyle. What I'm suggesting is that all of these systems are complex dynamic systems that build to the point of critical instability and then collapse. They can be revived and there are cycles, but we've had uh, two global civil civilizational collapses. You know, everyone, uh, I th my problem, Alan, is we live in a world of two second attention spans. Um, you go back, uh, the two greatest civilizational collapses in history were the decline of the Bronze Age, uh, the, the, the collapse of the Bronze Age um, around uh, 1000 BC and the collapse of the Roman Empire around uh, 500 AD. Uh, well, they were about uh, 1,600 years apart. It's been 1,600 years since the last one, since the decline of the Roman Empire. So don't think that civilization is always onward, upward, better. It's not. On that note, um, thanks very much, Jim. Thanks, Alan.